Hey everybody, welcome back. So my name's Rob, and this is a course on introductory statistics for the psychological sciences. And today we're going to be doing a lecture on plan comparisons and post hoc testing in ANOVA. As always, I'm Rob, and over here are the PowerPoint slides, and up here is our virtual whiteboard. However, since today we're just going to be going over some conceptual uh, information, I'm just going to take the whiteboard away, uh, and let's get started. Okay, so just a brief bit of review. So ANOVA. We do an ANOVA whenever we have an independent variable, typically that has three or more levels, uh, and we have a quantitative dependent variable. And then if it's a within subjects design, we do a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. And if it's a between subjects design, we do a one-way between subjects ANOVA. And essentially what an ANOVA test is attempting to address is the question, are the mean differences between two or more groups due to the effect of the independent variable or factor? And so um, basically analysis of variance is a, a mode of examining this data that uh, partials variance out into different buckets, predominantly into the between group variance or the variance that's explained by uh, the independent variable. And then uh, it's in units of unexplained variance or how much we didn't explain from the independent variable. Okay, so what does a significant F test tell us? This is where we left off in the second part of this lecture. So a significant F ratio tells us that at least one of the group means is significantly different from one of the other group means. It does not tell us which groups are different from each other. And that's what we really want to know. You can think of an F test as a test that tells us whether or not we need to investigate further. If something's going on that's worth our effort to explore. So for example, a significant F could mean that the Toffrino group is different from the Prozac group. It could mean that the Prozac group is different from the placebo group. It could mean that the Toffrenil group is different from the placebo group, or it could mean that all three groups are different from each other or any different combination of group differences. All the significant omnibus F test is telling us is that one mean, is, at least one mean is different from one other mean. So uh, essentially this test, again, is just telling us something's going on. You need to dive in and you need to either do a plan comparison or a post hoc test to determine where the group differences lie. Okay, so the reason we call the F ratio an omnibus test is because it, it's kind of an overarching test. It shines a light from afar and says, oh, something's going on here or something's not going on here. If you don't have a significant F, that means that none of the groups differ from each other. And so you wouldn't really need to investigate further. Um, however, once we have the significant F, we need to determine which conditions are different from each other. And this is done using either a priori planned comparisons or a posteriori uh, comparisons. So, an a priori comparison is typically used whenever you have a specific hypothesis about one group being different from another group. Or alternatively, you can even combine groups. So if we had, you know, two groups getting different type of treatment and one group getting a control, right, you could combine the Tofranil and the Prozac group together and compare medication versus placebo. Um, and th so the, the key here is that you would only conduct a planned comparison test whenever you have in advance specified some kind of theory-driven hypothesis. And whenever you have a theory-driven hypothesis, we don't need to control for the type 1 error rate. 
we can do that test and um, it's going to be more powerful and more sensitive to detect that specific effect. Uh, and this, the, what this, this planned comparison test is, is a, a, basically an adapted version of a t-test. In this case, it would be a t-test for independent groups. For a repeated measures uh, ANOVA, it would be a t-test for uh, correlated groups. Okay, so let's just suppose in advance um, using our same uh, example here, that we hypothesize that Tofrino would be more effective than Prozac at reducing depression symptoms. Well, so we're making this comparison between the Tofrino group and the Prozac group. So what do we do? Well, very similar to a t-test. We set up our hypotheses. We say, okay, the null hypothesis is that Tofrino will equal Prozac that the alternative hypothesis is that Tofrino will be lower than Prozac. And again, keep in mind what we're measuring here is a person's depression symptoms. So for Tofrino to be better than Prozac, we should have lower depression symptoms. So it's important to think through um, what, what a what lower depression or higher depression. If this was, if for example, if we were measuring self-esteem, we would want Tofrenil to be higher than Prozac. Um, so the language can be a little tricky. Make sure that you are setting your hypotheses up correctly given um, what you would expect from that dependent variable. Okay, the next thing we do is we need to find the critical value for the t-test we're gonna conduct. And when we do this, we use the degrees of freedom for the within or unexplained variance uh, from our ANOVA table. And we, we're always looking, since this is a, there's no directionality with uh, an ANOVA, and so this is inherently a directional test. So we use an alpha of 0.05, one tailed. And if we look at the t-test, right, so our degrees of freedom within was 12, and uh, we're looking at alpha of 0.05, that gives us a T crit value of 1.782. So then we come back, we set up our decision rule, we're gonna reject the null if T obtained is greater than or equal to 1.78. And then we basically compute the T obtained value. So this looks tremendously similar to our original independent groups uh, t-test when we computed t-obtained. The primary distinction is that ms within, uh, it, we're now using ms within, and before we were using something called the pooled variance. Imagine that, right? So they're the same. So um, you would essentially do that t-test, and if it's significant, then you can say that that, that Tofrenol is significantly different from the Prozac group. In the next lecture, we're gonna actually go through and do all of the computations involved. So sit tight for that one. Um, so what if you don't have any specific hypothesis up front? If you don't know, um, if, if you're really just exploring uh, how, what's going on with these groups and you wanna let the data kind of tell you without specifically asking an a priori hypothesis. Well, if you don't have a hypothesis about a specific group, then it makes sense to just do every possible comparison and see what comes out. So this is not a theoretically driven uh, type of test. And because we're conducting so many tests at the same time, we must correct for alpha inflation, like we talked about before. Um, if we just ran a bunch of t-tests, uh, it's going to dramatically increase the family-wise type 1 error rate, uh, which means that the probability that at least one of those comparisons is going to come out significant when it isn't um, is going to be really increased, and we, we want to protect against that. So to do that, we use uh, a post hoc test, and there's a, a many number of different uh, post hoc tests. There's the Tukey, the Shafe, the least significant difference test. Um, so they each have their strengths and weaknesses. 
Uh, the the Tukey test HSD stands for honestly significant difference. Um, this is probably the most common type of post hoc comparison test that people run. Uh, it's it's quite liberal, uh, and then it, it, you know it, it's it doesn't uh, constrain you uh, in terms of being able to find significance as much as other tests. And uh, basically, it controls for the type 1 error rate for all pairwise comparisons. Another common one is the Shafe test. It's more conservative. Um, it controls for every possible comparison that's being conducted. Um, both of them, ultimately, are going to get the job done. Some people prefer one over the other. In this class, we're going to go over the Tukey test just to give you kind of a conceptual understanding of what's going on. And then down the road, if you decided that you wanted to conduct a Shafe test, um, you, you would have the general sense to be able to look up what that equation is and how to conduct it. Okay, so for the Tukey HSD test, we have another table we have to use. So when we do uh, Tukey HSD, what we're doing is instead of looking at T crit and T obtained, we're looking at what's called a Q crit and a Q obtained. So we're going to have to look up our Q crit. And the way we do that is we look up in our appendix for the critical values of Q. Um, we're going to look up the, uh, we have to use the degrees of freedom uh, for our ANOVA test. So we had degrees of freedom between was three and degrees of freedom within was 12. And so that gives us a, uh, or I apologize. This is a very simple mistake. It's easy to make. We're not using degrees of freedom for the number of groups. We're using the number of groups. It's very easy to think, oh, that should be the degrees of freedom value, just like it was in the F test, right? So. The number of groups is what you're looking up. So our degrees of freedom was two, which means that there were three groups, Prozac, uh, Tofranil, and placebo. So be very careful there. It's an easy way to make a mistake. So we look up, we had three groups, and the degrees of freedom for our error term was 12, because there were five people in each group, and it's the number of people minus the number of groups for our degrees of freedom within. We get 3.77. So then we set our decision rules, and it's just going to be if our Q obtained is greater than or equal to our Q critical value. Um, that's when we reject the null. Then we calculate the Q obtained value for every possible comparison of means. So we're going to have a mean for Tofranil, Prozac, and placebo. That means we're going to have three comparisons. Tofranil versus Prozac, Tofranil versus placebo, placebo, and Prozac versus placebo. And essentially, the easy way to do this is you compute what's going to go in the denominator, and then you can either order the means largest to smallest or take the absolute value of the difference for the numerator. And um, so you can see you're going to do it for each test. Um, so this is the actual computation that it would be. And once you have your Q obtained for each of the comparisons, you just check them against your decision rule to see uh, if they're different. And in this case, since our Q uh, crit was 3.77, every one of these Q obtained different scores is higher than that. So we're going to reject each of these null hypotheses and conclude that M1 is not equal to M2, M1 is not equal to M3, and M2 is not equal to M3. So every group is significantly different from every other group. Um, okay, so then we would need to write this up. So I'm going to use a, uh, we'll use a post hoc test. I'll just do an example of writing up a post hoc test. In the next video, I'll do an example of writing up a planned comparison. But um, really, that's pretty much identical to writing up a independent groups t-test. So we say a one-way between subjects ANOVA was conducted to assess whether different types of antidepressant treatments would elicit distinct effects on depressive symptoms. 
Okay, key here, you wanna be able to identify that you needed to conduct a one-way between subjects ANOVA, and then you're gonna go into what did you find? So you might say that the omnibus test was significant, um, indicating that at least one of the treatment levels was significantly different from another. And then you report your F obtained value, right? But you put your F and then parentheses report the degrees of freedom between, comma, the degrees of freedom within. And then you get your F obtained. And then whether or not it would, the probability of type 1 error was less than 5% or greater than 5%. Um, so remember, if it's significant, P is less than 0.05. And if it's not, P is greater than 0.05. And then you're going to report your measure of effect size. It could be either eta squared or it could be omega squared. Um, omega squared tends to be uh, a, a better measure. However, it's a little more complicated to compute. Um, both of these measures are similar to what an R squared means. So what it's saying is the proportion of variance in the dependent variable that's explained by the independent variable. In other words, what, what percent of the reason that people change in depression symptoms is explained by the type of treatment they received? And so you're going to report that. You're going to report your effect size. And then it's good to summarize whether it's small, medium, or large and what proportion of variance in the dependent variable that independent variable explains. And then finally, you're going to start your write-up for the post-hoc. So you would say, given the exploratory nature of this question, a Tukey post-hoc test was conducted to explore differences between the different treatment types. Okay, Then you're going to write, what did you find from the post-hoc test? So all treatments were significantly different from one another with Tofranil, and then you report your mean, leading to lower depression symptoms than Prozac, report that mean, and placebo, and report that mean. Prozac was also effective, however, leading to significantly lower symptoms than placebo. And then you write your overall summary. On the basis of this evidence, it appears Tofranil may be more effective at reducing depression symptoms than Prozac, Prozac and placebo. However, if Tofranil is unavailable, Prozac is a more effective treatment than placebo alone. Now, when we get into these ANOVA write-ups, many people will struggle at this very last part. What does it mean? And the reason is you can't just compute all of the means, do all the comparisons, and then um, not try to wrap your mind around what that pattern of results actually is telling you. Um, this overall summary part, you need to demonstrate that you understand what the real world implication of this evidence is. And um, whenever we get into group, you know, tests that have, you know, four groups or so, which we'll do in the next video, um, you'll see that this can become a little more challenging. Okay. So here is the full APA style write-up for a one-way ANOVA. I hope you found this video helpful. Um, if you do, don't forget to like and subscribe the video. Hit the notification bell so you can get updated on future videos just like this one. And again, in the next video, we're going to be doing from beginning to end a full example of a one-way between subjects ANOVA. We'll do all the computations by hand every step. So uh, I hope uh, you'll tune in for that video and I hope you have a great day. Okay, 